I fell off into the sleep, and all of a sudden I had what I call a night vision. In the night vision, I was called to a ship down in the ports of Astoria, Washington, or, or Oregon, where the Columbia River flows into the Pacific Ocean. And uh, in the vision, I was on this ship, standing upon the bridge, that's where the wheel is, where they steer it, with a captain from, the, I believe, the Philippines, Captain Asacion, uh, the Atlantic pioneer, precious brother. I was standing on the bridge, and we were talking, when all of a sudden I just glanced out over the inlet to the Columbia River, and I saw all of these ships coming in, loaded with troops. And I was watching them, and as, as this would be the ship, the, the troop ships went right around the ship we were on, as though they didn't even see it. They didn't fire one shot at the men on the decks. They were down there walking around, the crew. They didn't fire any shots. I was thinking, well, this is interesting. And I was watching this phenomena, when all of a sudden I began to see them coming up to the docks, and where there were no ladders, they threw these hook ladders up, and they begin, these troops began climbing up these hook ladders onto the ports, and anybody they saw, they shot them. The captain is seeing this, and we're watching this, and all of a sudden he utters, he says, your nation is under siege. And I said, yes, it is, but look at this. This is different. And about that time we were looking over the bow of the ship, and underneath the docks came out these World War II vintage of planes, American planes with the star on them and the, and the, the flag the way they are, the old World War II vintage. And I believe that's very significant in today's world, and I believe you will begin to be able to understand a little more regarding uh, why it would be World War II type planes coming out from under the docks. Now, I don't understand them coming from the docks, but God was showing me symbolic many things, I believe, in this vision. They were going up into the air and firing on the motherships that all these troop carriers were coming out of. And I saw a couple of them hit and go down, and I'm watching this war literally take place. I'm hearing the screams of the people of the city of Astoria screaming as these troops are running through the streets and ousting people out of the houses and just shooting and I don't see anybody, any military coming to return the fire. It's as though we have no defense. And I'm looking at these troops and all of a sudden I begin to realize these are Chinese. What are they doing here? And that was the end of the vision when I recognized they were Chinese. But in the observations, they literally ran right around our gangplank, even on the docks. They didn't even see the gangplank. And that was the first vision that God gave me to begin to show me some of the things that were coming and to begin to bring my spirit aware and alert. And I remember that night, I got up and I began to walk the floor. My wife hadn't come to bed yet. And uh, I got up and was walking the floor when she came up to go to bed. And she said, what is it? And I, I told her the, the, the vision, the night vision I had. So that was the first vision I put on the shelf. The second vision I had is one I call the Prince Charles vision. The Prince Charles vision is a very interesting one because it has much symbolism in it, very similar to the book of Revelation. In the Prince Charles vision, I was made aware that it was a, an angel that came to me and told me, take the wife and the children in our Volkswagen van and go out Highway 26. When you come to the town called Government Camp, as you're coming out on Highway 26 of that town, look at your millimeter and go five miles to the tenth and there will be a pull-off from the road. When you come to the pull-off, pull off, get your wife and your children out, there will be a switchbacking trail down into the canyon. Take that trail, you lead the way, let your children follow and your wife bring up the rear. This was my instructions. So down the canyon wall we went, even as in all of a sudden in the vision, uh, this was an, a, a day vision. In this vision, we were went out, sure enough, in the van, the whole family, I load them in, and here was the switchbacking trail. We were winding down the switchbacking trail. The angelic visitor had said to me, there will be a person, you go down to the bottom of the canyon, and you come out of the, into a clearing, out of the underbrush into a clearing, 
and you will see a, a, a person there to meet you to tell you what to do next. And so here we go. We're walking down. The children are asking their questions, and we're just talking as we're going down, and I don't have any answers for them. We come out into the clearing, and standing in the clearing very properly and very poised is an English butler. He has a white towel over his arm, and he speaks very properly. He says, now then you've arrived. Please follow me. And that kind of a tone. And he just very, very properly turned, not even really making eye contact with us. He had a mission to do, and we followed him. We headed across the clearing, and as I was right behind him, we came to an edge of this clearing, and it went down. And as we came to the edge where I could see down, in a lower floor of the canyon, there was a very small platform down in the bottom, about 12 feet square, had one chair on the rear of it and a, and a microphone on the front. In front of that platform was 60 chairs, five rows of 12. I'm looking at this as we're going down and standing to the, the, the forward row to the side nearest us of this first 12 chairs was a senator and a general, four-star general. I'm looking at them as we're going down the grade, and I'm thinking, I know that senator, but I don't know that general. And so we get down there, and the butler introduces the, the, the senator seems to know my family, and says something, in fact, it's good to see you again. And the general says to me, as they're introducing, he says, yes, he says, you're the family that I've been hearing about. The general and I are conversing, and I, I don't remember the detail. God didn't want me to remember any detail of what we were conversing about. All, automatically, all of the 60 chairs were full. I glanced back, they were full, my wife and children. My wife was sitting down on the end, and my children had been seated. And so the butler said, please be seated, it's time to begin. And he kind of just sort of turned an angle like this away from us, reached under the arm where the white towel was and pulled out a two-way radio and upper, uh, uttered a few words. Then he began walking back up toward the grade and the, the clearing where we first came out and met him. And as he was walking up there, I heard this big helicopter come over the canyon wall behind me. I turned and looked and could see that it was a big double-bladed one, the giant ones like the military calls the egg beaters. And it was carrying uh, something very strange. I've never seen a military helicopter carrying one of these. I've seen them carrying a lot of things uh, around the military bases. But I've never seen them carrying a construction office the way they were carrying this one. And this construction office was a blue that I was to learn later was the United Nations blue. So I believe it has something very significant to do with the United Nations, the building that the, was being carried by the helicopter. It was on these cables. They came down to the area of the clearing and very gently let the construction office down and released the cables and the helicopter flew away. From that point then, the butler went up and unlatched the door and opened it for whoever was inside to step out, of which it was Prince Charles. He was wearing the cut-off short sleeves and short cut-off pant legs, and he had the wide-rimmed, kind of light brown type hat like you'd see in an African safari or in the Middle East. The butler was following behind him. He was coming down, leading the way, and I was looking at him as he came down the grade, and I thought, well, that's Prince Charles. But I said, either he's put on weight. No, I don't think he has. And as he got closer, I realized that his face was all red and puffy and his eyes were red. And I began to look at him and said, my goodness, he has really been crying. As he came closer, we all stood. The butler came up and uh, the general and the senator greeted him as though they had already met him. Then the butler introduced him to us and said, in, in a sense, uh, this is Henry Groover. And this is his family and this is his wife in that kind of a gesture. As the butler was doing this, Charles looked at me and he said, Thank you for coming today. You're the family I've heard about. You're here by my request. I have a message for you. Please be seated. With that, he turned to the general who was standing, and they came up and walked on the platform together. They conversed a moment. The general nodded, sat in the one chair back behind. And uh, as he sat in the chair behind, Charles stepped up to the microphone and he said, I thank you for coming today. You're here by my request. Please take heed. I have a message for you. And then he said these words. I must inform you that your nation is at war and you have a battle to fight. But the saddest thing is, is you must fight it without God. 
With that, the general behind him, the American four-star general, jumped to his feet, come down off the platform, came around on the, the ground in front of him, and looked up Charles very sarcastically, and he said, we know we're at war, and we know we have a battle to fight, but we didn't know God had anything to do with it. And with that, Charles brings his right hand up, and he comes right down like this between the eyes of the general in this motion. And he said, and sir, that is your mistake. And with that, they begin to argue why God or why he didn't have anything to do with it. And the argument went on. Everybody's intention was on it. I was watching straight ahead. But all of a sudden, in my peripheral vision, off to the left, there was a motion. And I turned to see what it was. And off to my left was a frog that was so big it wouldn't have fit under the ceiling. The motion I had seen off to my left that caught my peripheral vision was the frog's head had made this motion like they do before they're going to make the croaking sound when they fill the air sac under their chin. I watched it, and as that air sac began to fill and that dark green skin began to turn a yellowish color, terror literally swept over me. I, it was everything I could do to keep from jumping to my feet and, and interrupting Charles and the general and everybody and say, let's get out of here. If that frog opens its mouth and croaks, we're all dead. That was the kind of terror that was over me. About that time, its mouth opened. Out came out of its mouth, instead of a croaking sound, it came out a white vapor. It came right at us. It came right at Charles and the general. It enveloped Charles and the general. It was just about to hit my wife down on the end when all of a sudden I was caught up into the heavens. As I was caught up in the heavens, looking down on what I would call like Trafalgar Square, but Trafalgar Square has giant lions on the four corners facing north, south, east, and west. The lions themselves are up probably 10, 12 feet high just to their backs, let alone their heads. are made out of brass. Well, the lions were not in the square. The big fountain that you could easily put three or four of this size building into uh, was not there. Nelson's column was there, was not there in it. it was, the square was empty except for all of the buildings around it. And the buildings around it were like commerce, uh, libraries, churches, government office. And I, I think of Trafalgar Square is because it is a representation of the British Empire, all right, in its glory. So it is a representation of everything that you would do to run the empire. And I'm looking on this square that's, that's empty. There's no statues on it now. And all of a sudden, people start running out of this, into this open square from all of these buildings. And they're all dressed in their occupational garb. They all have, uh, the nurses have their little hats on, and the doctors their stethoscopes, the welders their, their leather apron and their, their goggle type hat that's up. And you can tell their occupation by their apparel that they're wearing. So, I would say that this event, whatever it is that has caught their attention, has caught them and they are running out, all fully aware of why they're coming out of the building. Because as they come out, they begin to point up, like in the direction the frog was. As I'm looking into the heaven, I'm in the heavens looking down on this square. I didn't see anything but the square at first. They begin pointing off to my left hand. Now remember, the frog was at my left hand in the vision, remember? And the vapor came from him. They're pointing in the direction of my left hand and they're mocking and scoffing and jeering and saying, you can't hurt us. You don't have any power anymore. We're not afraid of you. And they're literally mocking. And I turn to look to see what they're, they're, they're pointing at because they're pointing straight ahead. They're pointing way up. And I wonder, what are they pointing? And I look and then my eyes see this army that went from the bottom of the right by the square all the way into the heavens, clear up to the same level I was in the heavens. Off to my left hand was a Russian general, fully dressed in his full general's outfit with all of his braid and everything, standing in the heavens. His fists were clenched like this, and they were down at his side like this. His chest was out, and he was looking down into the square at these people. At his right hand was a rectangular weapon. I had never seen exactly that kind before. To me, it looked kind of like an anti-aircraft type uh, multiple cylindered weapon that they'd have on ships. But it wasn't quite. And as this band of people down in the square are mocking his army, 
and are literally scoffing and laughing at him and saying, you don't have any power, we're not afraid of you. I saw all of a sudden his neck muscles begin to thicken and his face begin to get a look of tension and he was getting angry. And then his blood vessels begin to bulge as all of a sudden his fist came up like this and he said, Present arms, aim, fire. And this massive army of footmen that come from the heavens clear down into the the level that these people were in the square. A people, this army that was stood like this before he gave the orders to fire. They were in full chemical warfare gear. And I didn't learn that until a man came back from maneuvers over in Afghanistan. And when he had me describe the uniform I saw in the vision, he said, Henry, you have perfectly described the Russian chemical warfare uniform. And he said, I didn't even know they had that kind of uniform until I just went over there myself and saw it. We didn't even have pictures to train for these because they're brand new uniforms. It's the latest of gear they have. But he said, I want to tell you something. Your description of their chest looking like the rib look of a, of, of a, of a, of a, a locust of the desert, the ones that make that buzzing sound in the summer, that was what their chest looked like. Their, their face looks kind of like, almost like a horse in a way, the snoot somewhat like a horse, and they had big googie eyes. And he explained to me, he said, the googie eyes or the goggles are the the head covering they put over them, it has the goggles, and the snooty looked like a horse, you said. He says, and they asked me the colors and everything, he said, that's exactly what the chemical warfare gear looks like. That has a pre-filtration system and a, a breathing apparatus that goes back down into this rib-looking chest that has multiple filtration systems. And he said, that is the most advanced chemical warfare gear that you can get on the face of the earth. And he said, I want to tell you something. We didn't have anything to match it. He said, they fired chemicals across and some of my men got into those chemicals and their, their, their chemical warfare gear began to just melt right off of them. He says, I don't know what kind of material they have, but we better find out. From that time, he said, I was scared to death over there. One one blast of this vapor could wipe out my whole platoon. Well, they were firing on the people, back to the vision, they were firing on the people in this square. As they fired the first shot on these people, I then saw something that I believe were being prepared for today. It totally caught these people by surprise. They sincerely, with their whole heart, did not believe that that massive military had any power, and they did not believe that that military would ever fire on them because of the response that was taking place there as they were fired on. They were taught by total surprise and total panic. And the whole action of that group of people in that square told me it was a surprise to them, even though they knew the army existed. They could see it going into the heavens, but they sincerely believed it would not fire on them. Now, remember in the Prince Charles vision, I may not have made this point clear, and I want to make this clear. When they were firing on them, and the people were caught by total surprise running back and forth, I was standing in awe that, that why don't they run into the buildings? Why don't they get out for cover? They just turn and run back and forth, and they weren't falling, but I could hear the bullets hitting them. And I wonder, well, why aren't they falling when all of a sudden I begin to realize this square all around, all the buildings, all the, the material things were disappearing all around these people as they ran back and forth in the square. Now that to me goes along with Ezekiel chapter 38 and the reason that they will come. You go up, verse 38, chapter 38 of Ezekiel, verse 11. He says, let us, I will go to them that are at rest that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now answer me a question. Is that a description of Palestine or Israel? Have any of you ever seen Israel or Palestine safe? You say, yeah, when the treaty signed, it will happen. Well, maybe. They are going to sign a treaty. I believe that. But I don't think it's going to last long. This says that they dwell the word dwell, look up the word dwell and exhaust it out in the concordance. It does not mean a temporal habitation. It means to inhabit, to possess, to settle in. 
That's a big difference between a treaty and crying out peace and safety. Big difference. Verse 12. Here's the reason they're coming. To take a spoil. To take a prey. To turn your hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered, gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle. All right? My, my third question. Does that fit Palestine? I have literally crossed Israel back and forth. I've walked up in the middle part of Israel. And I want to tell you something. I've never found a cow yet. Show me a cow in the middle of Israel. I'll show you cows down in, in the area of Ashkelon. And there are a few down along the Jordan Valley. Not very many. More in Ashkelon and that area in the farms there. Show me a cow in the midst or the middle of Israel. Well, you see, just one cow wouldn't do it. Because the first thing listed that they're coming to take is cattle. You're coming in, it says in, in uh, 38, to take a spoil, to take a prey. To a people that have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Question number five. Is the major population in the land of Palestine in the middle of Palestine? Folks, it's not. Look at your geographical picture. The main population is not in the middle of Palestine. It's around the edges. Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, it comes in a little bit for Jerusalem. But look, predominantly it's around most of the border areas along the Mediterranean. The reason they're coming in, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto you, Are you come to take a spoil? Have you gathered thy company to take a prey? to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil. I want to read to you this next article here, the Denver Post, 524-1992. Wichita. It got a bit hectic out here, Greg Rawls Farm, yesterday, when a delegation of 20 Russian diplomats stopped to ask a few questions about life on the American farm. The first question they ask is, where are your cows? First question, Russian diplomats. A delegate asked. Oh, there are a few of them here, Raul explained. Cows for milking? No, they're beef cattle. What will be your annual revenue? <laughs> the next question. About your house. What is the footage? How many bedrooms? Well... If you're getting ready to take occupancy, you want to know all that. And that isn't funny, but I want to tell you something. We're heading into a very serious period of time. I went up the Eagle Tower, and later I only learned it as Eagle Tower later. I didn't know the name of the tower. When I got to the top of it, there were eight kind of nobular looking Things on, on in, aiming eight different directions, north, south, east, and west, and in between. And I kind of looked at them, and they were in these notches like where you could fire arrows out from. And I was standing looking out over the island, uh, island of Anglesey. Standing there when all of a sudden, in this vision, I was shot up into the heavens and looking down on the earth like you would look at a satellite picture. You see it every time you see the weather. It looked somewhat similar, and I had supernatural vision. I looked down and I saw a massive military movement coming out of uh, the uh, Icelandic waters up above Iceland. I couldn't believe my eyes in what I saw. I saw this massive military movement coming out of this area up in here. It came down between, in the Atlantic, down between the United States and Europe. It was marine and air, as you can see, the, the airplanes. This was my first confirmation, in a sense, from, a, uh, from General Walker. General Walker has given me many confirmations. This was my first picture of actually that they had drawn this assault taking place. It shows also the movement coming out of Europe uh, across to take these countries. And NATO command center is right in here. So you're looking at some very very uh, serious fronts that Russia has been building and has. This massive military movement coming down between the United States and Europe just troubled me as I'm watching it. 
So then I looked off across at the United States wondering, well, if they're doing that across the Atlantic, what are they doing in the United States? That's too big to just be a, a maneuver. And I looked down, and as I looked across at the United States, I first saw the eastern seaboard of the Atlantic seaboard, and I looked and I saw these submarines look like they were parked right along our beaches, all the way along the east coast. And what I mean by along the beaches is where the sands, if you fly and look down in the ocean at the clear water of the ocean, you will see the point where the, the beaches begin, the white sands begin to turn, and it gets darker, and you can see the edge of the beach, so to speak, or the sand that's washed back into the sea. They were parked with their hulls right at the point of where that sand was beginning to discolor, and, and the floor of the ocean was coming through. And I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, they were all along there, and so I looked, because at that time we lived in Portland, Oregon, so I looked off across toward Portland, Oregon, and I saw these submarines along the Pacific coast, and I began to look all the way down as I looked down in towards San Diego. There they were, along our coasts. And as I was looking down towards San Diego, all of a sudden I saw motion all across the United States, and these radio towers, it's like they were coming out of the ground and going up into the air, and then they were dotting their lines out like they were broadcasting. And I was made to, to know that they were sounding the alarm. But as they began to sound the alarm, all of a sudden, the broadcasting signals went out and they sprinkled to the ground like dust. And I was totally aware, made totally aware in the vision, that the warning was not getting through. And I shouted in the heavens and I said, oh no, Lord, the warning isn't getting through. They won't even know what hit them. And as I said that, all of a sudden, the first missile fired out of a submarine and it went up and it hit right over New York City. I watched that city literally disintegrate into the atmosphere as that massive explosion took place. I mean, it was gone, folks. There'll be nothing left of that city. Then all of a sudden, I looked down along the coast and about where I would say be about Miami, Florida. And I told them down there last night, and they weren't too happy to hear that. And I said, and Miami disappeared. And then all of a sudden, because I was seeing this happen here, I looked away then. So I don't know if there were more explosions took place between those two as far as the coastal area. I didn't see it. My concern was over toward Oregon again because my family was in Portland at that time. As I was looking over toward Portland, I saw another explosion. It looked like it was in the area of Seattle, Bellevue. That area went up, just like New York and Miami. Then all of a sudden I looked down, and here's another one going off, and it looked like the San Francisco area. Then down about Los Angeles, just about to Los Angeles, and then San Diego. I saw those five nuclear-looking explosions. And I tell you, they literally devastated everything. Whatever was in their path, it went into the heavens. In the Russian invasion vision, I saw that massive military. I saw them hitting in on the nation and hitting our coasts and pounding them. And then all of a sudden, I was back down on the Eagle Tower looking at a left of the way down into the village automatic because that's the position I was looking at standing in the heavens. And I watched the village. The cars are going normal speed. People were walking normal, talking normal. And I thought, and I don't know how long I stood there and watched thinking, well, are the alarms going to go off at any minute? If this is happening in the United States, they've got to they gotta know it. They've got to sound the alarms. If there's that kind of a military going down across the Atlantic now, there's got to be some alarms set off. No alarm went off. So I began to settle in on that understanding, and so I uttered these words. Oh, God, if this is not happening, then what will be the sign of it happening and of its time? That was my word standing there. As I spoke those words, these words were spoken very clearly back to me. December the 14th, 1986, when Russia opens her gates and lets the masses go, the free world will occupy themselves with transporting, housing, and caring for the masses, will begin to let their weapons down, and will cry peace and safety. And that's when it will happen.